Hi, everybody. So we're here to go over briefly what this class is about and um, what you need in order to be prepared for it. But first, I have to tell you about the picture behind me. So this is a virtual background. Obviously, it's not in my house. Uh, there is a thunderstorm, so I might lose power. That's exciting. Um, this picture behind me is a picture of baby Yoda. I'm a total nerd, so my daughter has to come check it out. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I'm a total nerd, so I really like um, pretty much all things nerdy, including games and sci-fi, fantasy, all that stuff. Um, but this caught my attention. Stop. Sorry. This caught my attention because it was actually in a chemistry journal. So this is how chemists communicate discoveries. And um, this particular little guy was made with something called Rhodopsin B, which is where the, the sort of orange color comes from. And it was printed using a 3D printer. Um, just happens my husband has one similar to this. So I think I need to find some Rhodopsin and make a glow in the dark baby Yoda. Anyway, so Rhodopsin is interesting in terms of the chemistry that happens there. Um, this was done by a chemist who studies the kind of big structures um, molecules can form. And that's actually exactly what chapter 13 is about. Um, these, these intermolecular forces, or IMF as they're called, are pretty cool because it turns out that um, they hold most of our universe together. I don't know why the camera's not focusing on me. I guess Baby Yoda is just really fascinating. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So what we have here, um, that you'll find this in your notes packet, which I highly recommend that you use as you go through the videos, because as it turns out, the human brain doesn't process purely digital information very well. So the best strategy when you're watching my videos is to have your note packet and be taking some notes. You also want to have like a highlighter handy so you can maybe circle the questions that you have to ask um, during our live session. So as I was saying, um, the guy who made the baby Yoda is actually studying how different molecules interact with each other and how you can make them assemble into really big structures. This is a really, really important area of research, but in order to understand how it works, um, by the way, the reason it's important is because a lot of our medicines that um, are going to be sort of coming out in the next few decades are going to be based on these premises that you can trap a little molecule of medicine inside of a cage and that the cage will open up at the site in the body that needs the medication. So you could avoid a lot of um, side effects this way. Um, say if you're taking uh, a blood pressure medication, maybe you don't have to deal with some of the some of the side effects in the tummy or the sleepiness or anything like that. Um, so that's the idea. If you can target things using intra intermolecular forces, not intra intermolecular forces, then that's one excellent way of customizing medication. This applies to a lot of other areas too, but that's that's one that I know of that applies to biochem. So at any rate, we have um, three different molecules here. And this is kind of a quick review from 141. You should be able to, to kind of predict, based on these models, what um, kind of polarity each molecule has. And remember that polarity is not based on the bonds, right? So we've had two different kind of polarities that we talked about in Gen Chem. One, we had bond polarity. So like, for example, if you're just looking between the carbon here and the oxygen, you would say that that bond is polar because those two atoms are very different in their electronegativity values. And you would be right about that. But that doesn't tell you whether the entire molecule is polar or nonpolar, all right? The way to tell that is to think about the shape of the molecule. So I've given you kind of the shapes here by showing you the models, but even if I gave you a chemical formula, so if I wrote um, C2H6, oh, sorry, C3, there's three carbons, H6O, you need to be able to come up with a Lewis dot structure and then a Vesper shape that will give you the polarity of, of the whole molecule. All right, so pause the video, predict for each one of these three whether the molecules are polar or nonpolar. Okay, so this one is polar because it is asymmetric. You can slice it down the middle here, but you cannot slice it 
horizontally and have it be mirrored. That makes this polar. Um, you can even draw a dipole in here, all right? And so, so a dipole always points from the nonpolar side towards where the electron density is highest, which is the same as saying polar side. So this will be negatively charged and this will be positively charged. And I remember that because I write a little positive in the beginning of my arrow. So that's a dipole. It's showing us what direction the sort of electrons are going to slosh on this molecule. So it tells us there's less electron density on these carbons and there's more on this oxygen. That's based on the idea that, that the electronegativity of oxygen is much higher than carbon. On this guy, this one looks like a caterpillar. Um, So this one that looks like a caterpillar is made out of just carbons and hydrogen. We cleverly call them hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are symmetric. Every single one of these carbons has, you can't see it because it's in the back, but this carbon has three hydrogens and it's connected to one other carbon. So each one of these carbons has four bonds. That makes them tetrahedral, which makes it symmetric. So we would say any hydrocarbon actually is nonpolar, which means you can't draw a dipole. These um, electrons are going to be evenly distributed throughout the whole molecule because it's symmetric. This, of course, I hope you know, is water, right? And so water has hydrogen and oxygen, which have vastly different electronegativities, which means the bond is polar. Um, if you drew your Lewis dot structure like this, which is a valid structure, you might predict that this would be symmetric because it looks like it in two dimensions, but it's not because it's tetrahedral. You got four domains, two bonding, two non-bonding. So that leads us to a tetrahedral electron geometry. But because we have two non-bonding domains, we would have um, a bent molecular geometry. So the molecular geometry gives us whether it's polar or nonpolar. So this will be polar and its dipole goes up through the top of it as well. Now, it doesn't matter if I wrote, if I drew the oxygen um, this way, like I have in this model, or if I drew the oxygen this way, the dipole still points through from the hydrogen toward the oxygen. Okay, so how does this relate to intermolecular forces and how different molecules assemble? Well, I'm glad you asked that, thanks. It relates to it if we think about two different scenarios. So I'm showing you. Um, I'm showing you the same molecule here and here, and it's surrounded by water, all right? And so there's basically two proposals here. Either the water orients itself in this sort of linear arrangement like this, where all the dipoles point in the same direction, or perhaps the water arranges, this is option two, arranges itself so that the dipoles aren't so organized, right? So they're all gonna go like that. And they kind of go in random directions. Pause the video and write down, commit to one, make a hypothesis. Which one do you think it is? Do you have an idea? Okay. The answer is that it's number two. Even though number two looks less organized, the fact of the matter is it's actually more organized than the first one. So here, our dipole in our solute, right? That's the thing that's dissolved in the water. Our solute dipole goes up and down for both of these. Now, if, if I'm gonna draw the positive side um, of our molecule a little bit blue, that's classically, that means positive um, when we make maps of where electrons are at. And I'm going to draw the negative side red, right? And so here's the thing about our solute. The water is going to interact with it in such a way that the negative side, so negative is red, the negative side is going to interact with the positive side of the solvent, right? Something like that. And like this, and like this, okay? So while the waters seem randomly placed, in reality, they're not. They're orienting so that the negative side of one molecule 
is near the positive side of an adjacent molecule. That's a phenomenon called electrostatic attraction. It just says, it's one of the four forces of nature, and it just says positive and negative things are attracted to each other. And that happens on the molecular level as well. As it turns out, that has a fundamentally important meaning for us because it is the reason some things are gases, some things are liquids, and some things are solids. Um, it's the reason salt mixes with water. Okay, so it drives a lot of the physical behaviors that we observe. 